On today's episode, why the future of gas turbines lies in 3D printing. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on engineering.com TV today. Additive manufacturing has been the hottest topic in part making for years, offering unprecedented design flexibility for engineers. Hollow parts, parts with complex internal support structures and three-dimensional compound curvature that would be impossible to machine are all available with 3D printing, and the aerospace industry is all in with this technology. But what about the tough applications in propulsion? Donald Godfrey, gas turbine veteran with decades of experience at companies like Rolls-Royce and Honeywell, is Global Director of Business Development for Aviation and Defense with SLM Solutions, and is a global expert who has written a textbook on the subject. So what about the tough applications in propulsion? I had a chance to speak with him in Los Angeles at the recent Rapid TCT conference about the challenges and advantages of using additive technology in gas turbine applications. Take a look. Donald, uh, the aerospace perspective, uh, specifically propulsion. It's, we're looking at an environment, of course, where temperatures are astronomical and uh, jet engines in particular, they're heat engines, Delta T matters. So if you want efficiency, Delta basically we, 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 want that to, we want the hot section to run as hot as we possibly can. Of course. Completely antithetical to the materials that we, we make these things out of, basically. The perfect jet engine would probably melt itself in the, in the process of running this. Right. So additive has now moved into a realm where uh, refractory materials, high temperature alloys are possible. We're starting, we've seen some movement in the hot section with, with fuel nozzles, with things that are, uh, are not traditionally thought to be places to put additive. Now we're looking at entire rocket engines being made with this technology, basically. Is additive basically, are we gonna see a world essentially where the traditional casting, forging, blisk, we're gonna, we're gonna fir tree blades into a, into a hub, is that gonna go away? Well, you're, you can, in particular, fir trees. Yeah. All right. Um, you can print a near net shape. Um, the The issue with with uh, blades is that I, I've made I've made blades for turbochargers, and we've spun them at a hundred thousand RPM with no creep. Um, when but blades are being printed today for the LPT section of a turbine engine. Um, the HPT blades typically are so hot, they're single crystal. And the technology has not evolved to the point where we can print single crystal. So those are still cast, but the stators uh, are printed in many engines and the compressor blades are printed uh, in many engines because they don't have to be air cooled. Um, LPT blades are some in some cases are printed. Um, so we're not seeing creep growth in the rotation of these blades. So yes, it has evolved. 10 years ago, it was not even thought of, of printing a blade because they were afraid of the rotation causing a creep effect. But over time, we've learned that that concern can be controlled. Now, early examples, of course, we recall their issues where creep was so so serious. We're talking about uh, case contact in some cases. It was it was, yeah. and of course, then the, the seals people, of course, basically say that you know this isn't. We're, we're aiming for efficiency. We don't want leakage, so we want the you know we want to maintain clearances as as, as, as closely as we can. And creep was always been in fact the high temperature guys had it in spades. It was always a, a, a serious problem. But now we're talking about production engines. In some cases, these engines, of course, is that we need to come in at, at cost, and the MRO guys are not going to tolerate. Re replacing low pressure or high pressure sections with the kind of ways that commercial aviation wants to use these things. Right. So you have to be careful when you when you go into an MRO market. All right. So you are allowed to use additive to do some repairs, but to replace a blade that has been cast with a printed, you are now talking about an engineering part number change. To do that, you need to recertify the engine. And that starts, depending on the engine, at a million dollars and up. So you're not going to start replacing blades on a commercial airline that was cast with, now I'm gonna print them. That's not gonna be allowed. You have, you can do, you can do some repair of a cast blade. And we've been using DED technology for years. But in some cases, you can use powder bed to build up that parapet area. 
but you're not replacing the blade. That would make it a new part number and thus a new recertification. So that that would be that answer for that one. Uh, Donald, of course, uh, the sexy part of the jet engine is always the hot section. Everybody right. everybody wants to talk about the but where the temperatures and pressures are, are the highest for sure. The twin spool guys, of course, we know we've, we've all been down that road. But um, bypass ratios are increasing all the time to levels where they're now talking about throwing the cowling away and we're, we're back to unducted fans and, 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 and prop fans again, 40 years after we walked away from, from that technology. But it, for the medium ratio, turbofan technology, which is that sweet spot for regional airliners, biz jets, that kind of thing. Not huge fans, basically. Additive. Is there room there at the front of the engine, basically? Because those fan blades are big. They are big and they're incredibly expensive. Um, if you need a front frame, let's say it's aluminum, for example. Um, these now are 600. You can see here this base of this rocket motor is 600 millimeters uh, squared. And it, obviously it's tall enough that you could do a front frame. So in some cases, you're not going to, you're not going to do something like a 767, but you could do APUs. You could do smaller, um, I'm going to call them smaller Rolls Royce engines, smaller Honeywell engines that are in the 3000 horsepower range. That it, That is now possible instead of spending a year to get a casting or machining one out of a block of aluminum, you you can print it. Yeah. Of course, uh, again, we um, the, the sexy part is the aerodynamic shape of the blade. But uh, for old manufacturing guys like me, that fur tree matters. And the uh, matters. and and the, right. the EDM fellows, of course, have, have they've done a great deal to perfect their technology. But a lot of profile grinding people still say, you know, if you want the finish and the dimensional accuracy you want, come to us. Is it will three D printing reach a point you think where basically we're going to get so close to net shape that you can pull a lot of cost out of that blade? So when you when you look at a blade with a fir tree, some blades are forged, right? So that you're not going to get any cheaper than that. It's a hundred dollar blade, and you're not going to repair it. You're just going to throw it away and go get another one. Single crystal blades, we don't have the ability to do single crystal. We can do air cooled. I personally have printed air cooled blades, but they're not single crystal blades. They would be Inconel 738, for example. Marium 247 is still the preferred cast component, but you're, you, some companies will wire EDM a fir tree. The old fashioned way is to broach and grind, right? Broach or grind, maybe both. Um, the tolerances are so tight, you're not gonna get away from that. Even if you EDM it, you still have to grind it because you're talking plus or minus five tenths, if not even tighter. So you will always have those traditional manufacturing methods, but you can print blades, and we've done it, that'll get you near net shape. Now, what does that get you? For example, I can take a year, literally a year, out of your casting process by printing a blade. That does not mean I have enough material property data to put it in a production engine. Have I put them in engines? Yes. But the companies have not gone to the FAA and said, I want to do this. There's still that, oh my God, I, I have a printed high pressure turbine blade. Um, it, are we going to get there? We could. With enough coating, with the right coating, the TBC on it, and with enough airflow through the blade itself, you could do it in some situations. But as far as near net shape, you can get there. You can get there. And, and when you look at combustion section, hot sections, companies now are in production with H Haynes 230, Haynes 282 um, alloy for combustors. Um, 625 combustors are being printed. Uh, turbine blades are being uh, um, printed in some applications, right? Uh, impellers are being printed. Dual alloy impellers are being printed, which is pretty cool because you don't have to diffusion bond them anymore. This gives you a much better bond if you can weld a titanium onto a 718 versus trying to bond them in a hip furnace. That's sometimes, that's not always easy to do. 
Um, so there are many hot sections parts that are now being printed. And this, this baby is, is very common. This, this many companies are doing rocket combustion nozzles or rocket engines, um, especially the smaller ones, the micro satellites, they're, they're being printed easily. So yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Well, that's it for today's episode of This Week in Engineering, brought to you by engineering.com. For our deeper engineering series, visit engineering.com TV for exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, Designing the Future, and the Engineering Roundtable, not found on our YouTube channel. The links are in the description below. Thanks for watching.